Hi everyone, this is Carol Watson. I'm the Chief Thriver at Thrive.com and thank you for joining us on our first live Thrive Talk. We're here to welcome Gabriela Alcantara Diaz. Please excuse my R's, I keep trying, but we're, we're excited to have her here and I wanted to first set up what this experience is going to be because it may be new for many of you. Hopefully you've had a chance to see our site and get some sense of, of the experience. We're here to help and create an environment where people can thrive in their career and providing them really great content and a very great interactive experience to ask the questions that you're really interested in and get the answers that you want and create a really strong community. So Thrive Talk is designed to be a weekly live interactive experience and what that means is that we really want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions, we want to hear your comments. There's a chat area below the, the the visual that you're seeing and so it gives us an opportunity to hear the questions that you have so please contribute I can ask Gabby any question that you have um, of course within means uh, but we want to get started to hear more about how Gabby has created a, such a meteoric rise in the industry her thoughts on women's leadership and how she can share her insights with you as well as what's going on at GAD Marketing Communications and how we can learn from that and help support um, everyone's journey in the business. So welcome, Gabby, to our conversation. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. I'm so excited to share multicultural insights and really you're an amazing leader and I'm very excited to hopefully uh, help you thrive further. That's fabulous. Well, to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about your role? There are some people that may or may not be familiar with the industry. We want to get them um, kick-started with uh, some good insights um, on what the role that you have there is and what GAD specializes in. Well, basically, I love strategy. So uh, for me, it's really always been about being a cultural strategist. I'm the founder of GAD, um, started the agency as a boutique about almost four years ago, and we specialize on the emerging upscale Hispanic market. But within my role, what I've seen in the last 25 years is that I truly believe that cultural insights is what drives me, and also uh, developing very strong relationships with the client. And when we talk about our agency and what I personally have as a passion point is nurturing relationships, which to me I think are truly the fundamental success of any agency. You're, you're really an extension of the client business. So here at our agency we basically develop communications campaigns on behalf of corporate clients that are interested in getting more involved in the Hispanic market but truly trying to market to the upscale, the sort of the coming of age segment that we're seeing across America today. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your major clients and just a few minutes on some of the major campaigns that you've been involved in with them? Well, I'll give you a bit of historical, if you don't mind. Uh, being in the business, and I probably will date myself a bit, but I've been in the business almost 27 years. And uh, we've been very fortunate, actually, our creative director, which is uh, my creative partner, uh, we, she and I have been working together for 27 years, if you can believe that. And through that historical, we've had the benefit of working on brands such as regional players like public supermarkets that were very dear to us because we had the benefit of working on that business for 23 years and basically building it from the ground up in terms of understanding and becoming a leader in the Hispanic market um, as well as Johnny Walker Black Label that was a huge pivotal moment in our career because um, through the career of being in an independent agency as we continue to be an independent agency we had the benefit of working with global agencies and we were the only independent agency back then when it was called the IAC group and had the benefit of developing global platforms that basically were in um, linked up with the global strategy and masculine progress. One of the clients that we currently have is Amscot Financial, which is a Florida-based client, and we're very excited because they've decided to enter the Hispanic market, and we're basically bringing it from the ground up 
in developing an overall brand strategy for them to be the leader in the marketplace here in Florida. That's fabulous. Congratulations, and you don't look a day over 25. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I know that your um, agency did some research on upscale Hispanic Latinos, and we have some content on Thrive for the viewers to get more information on, but can you tell us a little bit more about what initiated that and how you find it being used currently? Okay, well basically um, the Upscale Hispanic study came about, uh, for us as an agency, it's very important as part of our, our key vision is to redefine Hispanic America. So we find that, again, there's a market within a market that needs to be spoken to and also provide a halo effect overall in terms of where the Hispanic market is going. So that concept basically was brought to AHA, which I belong to, the Association of Hispanic Marketers. It's the, uh, the voice of Hispanic marketing. And with partners such as AHA, Nielsen, as well as Santiago Solutions Group, we develop and formalized an overall study, which includes uh, two waves in basically understanding who this consumer is. And at this point, what we found and unveiled uh, during the last two years is that 40% of the Hispanic market is currently considered an upscale segment, where that would be constituted by a household that basically has an earning of 50 to 100,000. We wanted to start in the middle. Mm -hmm. And basically, they represent 30% of the total buying power in the U.S. Uh, for Hispanic buying power in general. Fabulous. Is there any number or great factoid that would surprise us about upscale Hispanics? Well, one of the things that we did find is uh, in our second wave, we addressed the level of optimism and also looked at premium cosmetics as well as casual dining. And we found that, in fact, the overall upscale Hispanic versus the non-Hispanic upscale uh, there was a greater incidence of visitations with casual dining and as well when it when we talked about um, premium cosmetics there was also a greater purchasing rate and potential to purchase in the future among that upscale Hispanic so there are definitely certain categories that uh, would probably uh, have a huge success rate if they would uh, target the uh, upscale Hispanic market at this point well, hopefully we'll be able to get the word out even more and, and help those marketers get generate a lot more business. So I want to turn the conversation a little bit to women in leadership. I know it's a huge passion point for you, and I wanted to get a sense of why that's so important and what, do you, what are you seeing in the marketplace right now about women in leadership, particularly Hispanic women? Well, first I'm going to thank you because I think that you, um, I really believe you inspired me to think about uh, this owning your truth and owning your successes. And when you and I had several conversations, that really just came to mind when talking about thriving. And when I talk about owning your truth, and you and I have spoken about this at length, is that women in general, and I believe multicultural women in general, is your diversity is your asset and one of the things that um, I've been honored and blessed and I'm very thankful for is that I've always been extremely proud of being a Hispanic woman and I was raised in a multi-ethnic uh, household my parents are from two different countries my mother's from Uruguay my father's from Spain and for me having that perspective was always an asset so when you own your truth is own the diversity. There's differences that in fact make you unique and that allows you to, uh, it empowers you. Also, when you own your truth as women, it's okay to own your failures. Failures give you confidence and you and I spoke about this with regards to the gender roles where men oftentimes in society are seen as leaders because of their failures, whereas women are not basically allowed to fail. 
Um, so I think we've, we've come to a point, especially with the younger generation, where we're almost really equal to a point mentally. And it's okay to own some of those failures because that gives you strength in the long haul. So when we talk about owning our successes, one of the things that we find is that women, because we enjoy being in collaborative efforts, we enjoy nurturing, we enjoy giving the other person recognition, we need to start owning some of those successes. We know that we've been the visionaries in certain areas. We've, le we've been the leaders in, in um, maybe addressing areas that have not been considered in the past. And it's okay if we're following through, through the project, let's say, but let's take ownership of that leadership, that insight, and even if, in fact, some of our greatest assets it's, is about nurturing, one of the things that I wrote down as a note is that um, there are certain successes that may not be the norm, but there still are successes, and we should, in fact, share that with everyone. Well, thank you. That was awesome. I wanted to, we do have a question, but I wanted to just complete this, this thought. Um, I, you know, I think we've talked about this. I don't really believe in the concept of failing. I think that it's all a learning and it's all great. Um, so as a leader that's had many years of success, can you point to um, some, some time that you've stepped out in a place of possible fear, maybe not, but a possible risk? and had some learning that you can share and how you are able to turn that around? Um, well, in terms of transitioning business models, uh, I believe that was a, a huge risk, uh, basically having to start from the ground up again uh, was a huge risk. But what I found in that learning is that as, as women, we need to surround ourselves uh, with a hub of professionals that are basically our allies. Um, I believe that we have a greater opportunity to also reach out for uh, greater mentors and individuals that can help us in certain areas of growth. And also there was an opportunity um, where in fact looking back uh, some of my fears in trying to not impact other people's lives basically did not allow me to take the risk. For example, can you change For, the means to protect the innocent but share a little bit more? To protect the innocent, right. Uh, oftentimes we, we, maybe as women, um, basically are always thinking ahead. So we're, we're always focusing on consequences of actions and sometimes even if there are consequences, we need to weigh the balance. We basically need to balance the risk. And sometimes women, and speaking on my end, obviously not generalizing, is that we just allow for the consequence to take over the huge potential in the long run. That's awesome. Thank that you. That makes sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. I want to make sure we don't... Um, lose some of the questions and, and keep our audience engaged. We have a question going back to the upscale Hispanic research that you've done around uh, cosmetics and the, the Hispanic females. So the question is, do you think that Hispanic upscale Hispanics would respond to products specifically targeted to them? For example, a line of cosmetics tailored to Hispanics, or is it more about repositioning the existing products such as Lancome to target that market? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I, I believe it's about repositioning. Uh, it's like like any, you know, one of the things that we say with multicultural marketing is that you've got to think as a marketer as a new product rollout. So oftentimes marketers will, will spend a lot of money and a lot of years thinking about uh, a new product rollout, but when it comes to the multicultural, they don't give it the same, the same importance. So in understanding your product SKUs, there may be an opportunity to actually select certain products that would do better. There may be an opportunity to just reposition the brand. There may be an opportunity to actually focus more on the premium product than it is on the middle product, on the middle, uh, middle market product. So um, specific just to the Hispanic, um, yes, we come in all colors and that may be an opportunity. But I think it's really more about understanding the brand, the portfolio, and how to really 
position it in the marketplace. Awesome. Do you think? Do you, can you name any brands that you think do a really great job, or can use more um, thought around that? Well, I mean, you've got mid-tier brands like the Lancomes, and uh, you know, obviously, you've got the, your your uh, uh, what do you call it? The um, convenience uh, type of the the cover girls. But if if you start thinking of the Cliniques, um, more of the, you know, even Bobby Brown. There's certain brands that if they would work a little harder, uh, they could definitely tap into the more upscale Hispanic woman. Awesome. Because also we have to, and, and just to, if I can speak to this, Carol, is also understanding the, the category affinities, and it starts there. So if there's a category affinity and then understanding why that category affinity exists, then you can start developing your overall brand strategy, but it, you have to take into account that multicultural insight. Thank you. That was really helpful. So while we're on the topic of women in leadership in this industry, I think one of the things that we've talked about are the Hispanic agencies, and I think they're all going through a bit of a transformation um, around total market and, and where the Hispanic um, marketing budgets are going. Can you speak on the topic of Hispanic leader females in this industry and why do you think they are doing well? What are some of the things that you're hearing in this space? Specific to Hispanic women or to Hispanic agencies? Both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, um, since I started a while back, it was interesting. When I first started in the industry, there were a lot more Hispanic female CEOs, and they were independent owners, and especially regionally from a, from a Florida perspective, most of the large agencies were all started by Hispanic women. And it's interesting to see almost 30 years later that there's been a shift where now you're seeing a, a predominance of more men, which I find very interesting. And um, I, I believe women will start emerging, but maybe they're looking at other opportunities or maybe they're going more into global companies and not necessarily starting their own business. Uh, the whole conversation of Hispanic marketing and Hispanic agencies, to me, uh, at the end of the day, you need to understand that what comes from within ultimately is going to be your strength. So when you've got agencies that are managing every type of segment, you can't be everything to everyone. And there's no way that that DNA of that agency can really identify and address the complexities of this emerging majority that we call multicultural. So with that said, you still need, um, and I wouldn't even want to call it ethnic uh, agencies, but it's truly understanding that you've got to have representation of the different segments across the entire operational scheme of your agency. Because if not, as we all know, um, whatever drives the power is the power will remain there. And I'd like to also make reference to to this, um, which in my personal experience, I really sort of by default fell into Hispanic marketing when I worked part time at Carnival Cruise Lines while going to college full time. I had the benefit of, as when I graduated, to interview with a very large agency that was at that time considered Anglo, and it was McFarlane and Dreyer. And then I had the opportunity to interview with this very small shop that was a Hispanic-owned agency. I wasn't prepared or said, oh, I want to be a Hispanic marketer. I just wanted to be a marketer. But in hindsight, I'm so thankful that happened to me because, as I'd like to quote Malcolm Gladwell, um, sometimes it's good to be a big fish in a small pond. And it allows for us to basically really thrive and build on that confidence because we are. We are a big fish in a smaller pond and you're able to learn a lot more. And I believe that that will continue to resonate with um, multicultural agencies. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. We have about one more minute left, and we had a question on mentoring, but I was wondering, one of the, the last things I always want to ask a guest are what is it specifically that helps you to thrive? I don't know if you can build both of those answers into one in the, in the one minute that we have left, but how would you answer that? What helps me to thrive is that I'd like to uh, listen. I reach out uh, to my confidants and really try to listen for advice. Mentorship at a business level, at a legal level is critical. And also understanding that my clients also become my mentors. I bounce a lot of things off of former clients and existing clients because we, we have that level of transparency. And when you have that type of trust and relationship, you're able to truly grow together. So that's one of the advices that I would also give not only to women leaders, but also to um, multicultural agencies and in, 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 in working with, with their clients and how they can leverage that relationship through mentorship. Well, thank you, Gabby. This was fabulous. We really appreciate you spending time with us in our Thrive Talk, and we want to thank you, say thank you to our incredible underwriting sponsor, Microsoft, for supporting us in this uh, initiative. I hope you all have gotten some great insight and information. Please feel free to continue to ask questions. I'll ask Gabby to respond um, on Thrive so that you can get some responses to the questions that you have. Join us next Friday at 12 noon Eastern Time again. We'll, we will be having Ahmad Islam who is a managing partner in the newly formed Common Ground uh, MGS partnership that everybody's excited about. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, Carol.